into criminal justice law. Do you mind giving us a little insight on your professional journey? It all dates back to when I was 11 or 12. I know you guys have been best friends since you were 12. So around that time for me, um, I stumbled upon TV, uh, you know, watching the OJ Simpson reruns and clips and documentaries. And I was just, I, I was glued to the TV. I couldn't stop watching. I just thought it was so fascinating. There was this one particular attorney on, on OJ's dream team who, when he spoke, when he got up in court, I was mesmerized, honestly. And I didn't even know what his role was. Like, I didn't know about a lawyer, right? Like, I didn't know what a trial lawyer was. And I remember pointing at the TV and I said to my mom, whatever that man is, is what I'm going to be when I grow up. And so I really haven't veered off that path since then. In college, I double majored in political science and criminal justice. And I got my master's in criminal justice. And then I taught criminal justice and then went to law school. Then I got a job clerking for judges. And so what that is, it's a judicial clerkship. The best way to describe it, I think, is like you're an attorney for the judges. You help them decide their cases. You write decisions, opinions, whatever it might be. I just adored it. I, I loved that job, right? And it wasn't it wasn't exactly what I had envisioned doing exactly right out of law school, but it was an opportunity that came my way. And it was just the best. I loved my judges. I loved the court. I loved the cases I was working on. And, you know, it's funny because the first, I would say the first, like maybe three months of that job is when I felt like I finally learned how to write. You know what I mean? Like I went to, you know, law school for three years. I, I spent three years like killing myself in school, like trying to like become a, you know, the best, you know, future lawyer I could be. And it's like none of that really prepared me <laughs> for the calm, to be honest. That was in Virginia because I went to law school in Virginia and um, I was I'm licensed in Virginia. And then after that clerkship, because clerkships are for a finite period of time, usually one to two years. And so after that clerkship, I was like looking for a change. I was, re I was ready to leave Virginia. I, I have such an affinity for where I live and, or lived. And, you know, I miss it, but it was time to move on. I had no family there. And my mom had suggested, you know, my moving to Florida, because I'm from New York. And I, thought about it. I was like, yeah, why not? But I had no job lined up. I wasn't licensed in Florida. You know, like I just made the decision like, yeah, of course I'll move to Florida, you know? Um, and so I then just another opportunity fell in my lap. It was the same job, a judicial clerkship in Florida. Um, and I did it at the trial court level, you know, in the state court. Um, and it was just, it, it really- Wait, can we just define like a little bit of what you said just yes. now? So at the trial court level, at the state, at the state. Okay. just for those Let of us who are up. not I'll familiar with any of this. Yeah. <laughs> I will back up. So basically there is a state system and a federal system. You have the trial court level and then every court above that essentially is an appellate court. Appellate courts review the decisions of the trial courts. And then the higher you work your way up, the appellate courts, the higher appellate courts review the lower appellate court's decisions. But what an appellate court does is say, did the trial court make the right decision based on the law in the facts and applying the facts of that case in that case? So that's what the appellate court, you know, is reviewing. And then a higher appellate court will say, did the lower appellate court review that decision correctly, right? This sounds very boring when I break it down this way, but it's actually pretty exciting. Um, <laughs> I worked at the trial level for trial, you know, court judges. So there's a lot of different cases, right? It's not just like appellate courts, you know, they have fewer cases because they're, they're on review, right? Whereas the trial court is like, anybody can sue for anything, a low level crime or it's murder. This is all happening at the trial court level, right? I 
always wanted to be a trial lawyer. So while I love appellate law and, and I do have such an appreciation for the practice of appellate law, but I really love the trial court level work. And so I did my clerkship at the trial court in Virginia and then again in Florida. You know, you can do a judicial clerkship at the appellate court as well, you know, at the appellate level, I mean. Um, whether it's, you know, the Court of Appeals or it's the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court is also considered an appellate court. I digress. <laughs> so after my second clerkship, I got my job, my current job as a prosecutor. And so that's where I am at now. And I, I love it. I have to say this, it, it's like, this is what I've been waiting for, right? Like, to finally get into the meat of the, the criminal, you know, trial work. And I, I, I love it. I'm, I'm so fulfilled and I'm invigorated and it's, I just, yeah, I have a lot of positive things to say about it. Yeah. We touched briefly on your education. Are there any undergrad majors that you would recommend that someone get if they want to pursue a, a uh, career in criminal law? So, I think that if you specifically want to go into criminal law and not just, you know, you want to be a lawyer and you don't know really which path you want to, you know, go down. If you specifically do want to do criminal law, then I, I would say criminal justice is a great major for that. And I specifically chose my college and my graduate school because they were the second best in the nation for criminal justice, which was, you know, it's not, it's not a field that's, you know, or a major in every single college, right? Um, it's, it's up and coming, but it's not everywhere. And so I, I tried to choose, you know, where I was applying based on who had programs in criminal justice. And I went to SUNY Albany in, in New York and they really had, you know, developed their program and had great connections. And, you know, I, I just, it was, it was a great program for criminal justice. And I think that if that's something that you are interested in, specifically criminal law, then that would be a great major for you. I'm glad that you touched on connections. Were there any particular extracurriculars or internships or programs that you would recommend someone try out while they're an undergrad? Yeah, I mean, definitely. I want to start with the macro of all of them, right? Like, I can't speak highly enough of interning. I think that it's it's a great experience, it's fun, but it's also imperative to furthering your career, right? And landing where you wanna land. I say, don't limit yourself with your internships. Um, a funny story, my first internship I ever had, I, had a, I was in a co-ed pre-law fraternity. So I'm, I'm kind of answering a few of your questions, I think. Um, yeah. <laughs> so I was in a co-ed pre-law fraternity. There was this internship at the New York State Assembly, which is, you know, like New York State government, right? Like you have the federal government and then you have like state governments. And so it was New York state government. A lot of my fraternity brothers, everyone was a brother, girls, boys, everyone was a brother. So a lot of my brothers had done the internship and were like, some of them had, you know, been applying for the internship. And I was like, I want to do this intern. Like, this looks awesome to so, like work for an assembly member. Like that is so cool. And so my sophomore year, when I was 18 years old, I applied to intern. A lot of my brothers were getting their acceptance letters and I was not, I, I wasn't getting my re a rejection letter. But I just wasn't getting an acceptance letter. And like some of my brothers had received a rejection letter and I was like, Oh God, that's okay. Like I, Am I just like being rejected? They're just not going to tell me. Like time was going on and on. Like a long time was going on and I wasn't hearing anything. I'm like, okay. Eventually an internship was starting like the first week of January. Okay. So fast forward, I'd applied back in like September, fast forward to like December, end of December, winter break. <laughs> I'm like, obviously I was rejected. Like, you know, uh, <laughs> and, um, I'm in Florida, actually, on vacation with my family, visiting my grandparents. I get a call, like, after Christmas. So, like, now we're, like, a week away from the internship starting. They're like, okay, yeah, yeah. we want you. And I was like, what? <laughs> but, <laughs> but if you go back, by the way, I had called them, I want to say maybe, like, a month before that. And I was like, I haven't heard anything. What's the situation? And they were like, well, Brooke, you know, this internship was for juniors and seniors. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, you're a sophomore. And I was like, yeah. And they're like, okay, so it's like for juniors and seniors. 
I was like, okay, yeah, like I, I hear you. And then that, <laughs> that exchange, it was like a broken record, but it was like verbatim, just that that exchange we had, like, she's like, okay, and you're a sophomore. I was like, I get it, like, I, I know. <laughs> and so I was like, okay, I'm being disqualified because I'm just, I don't meet the like basic requirements. When they finally accepted me, I was like, okay, I guess I'm like, they were last pick of the letter. You know what I mean? Like, I, I was like, I guess they needed to fill a spot or something. Yeah. And I get there and on the second or third day, they called like the internship committee called me to the office. And I was like, oh my God, am I in trouble? I didn't do anything. I didn't even speak yet, you know? Got and, here. <laughs> <laughs> like what's happening? Um, and they were trying to like scope out my political views to play, because they place each intern with an assembly member. And my, my political views are very different now than they were back then. But um, I, when I told them what they were, they were like, okay, we wanted to just make sure. And they ended up placing me with the minority leader pro tem, which in layman's terms is essentially the vice president of the minority party. And out of 170 interns, that was one of the top three internship positions. And I was like, wait a second, what, you know? Um, and so I, I say this story to basically say, I, I didn't even let, you know, a basic qualification, I'm not saying that that's, that's gonna work in every situation. <laughs> but I think that I was so, driven and so determined and I wanted it so badly right and I think that it showed to them and I think that I made that very clear um and that internship you know really I feel like was the stepping stone for me getting so many things after that because during that internship I applied to my next internship which was for you know a fortune 500 company working in their patent law department and me doing patent law is like Obviously, that's not, we're not, you know, that doesn't go together, but it was a good experience, you know what I mean? And then that internship, or during that internship, I applied to a different internship, you know, um, for the New York Public Interest Research Group. And it's just, it, it led one thing to another to another. And I think that that's um, really how you get started and how you just, you take the plunge, right? You just dive in and everyone has no experience at first, right? It's just the mm -hmm. truth of the matter. And then you do get experience. You get your first, you land your first job, you land your first gig. It could be super small, right? Like you could be the bottom, bottom, bottom tier person at the place, but you work your way up. That was kind of my, inter my beginning internship experience. What about, we touched on internships, we touched on building connections, building your network, working your way up. Can you talk to me a little bit about your LSAT, mm. grad school? We can talk about the bar exam. If oh, you want God. To. I don't know if you've blocked that out of your mind. <laughs> it sounds like you're laying the foundation with your internships, your extracurriculars, you're building your network. Yeah. Can we talk about the technical aspects of your Absolutely. LSAT, taking the bar exam, going into grad school? For me, grad school was you know, that's a separate thing, right? Like if you're gonna go to grad school, that's, I feel like separate than going to law school. Like that's something that you're just, oh. that's a different path kind of. Um, I mean, I studied criminal justice in graduate school and you know, it was great, but if you're, a lot of people don't get their masters, um, you know, before law school. And so, but if, if you're specifically wanting to just go right into law school, then yes, the LSAT comes. And I, I what I will say about the LSAT is that it's super learnable. It's not like an IQ test where it's like, whatever you score is what you score. No, it's not like that. Um, if you study and you study the right way, you can do really well, build your score, and um, which is what I did. And how long does someone usually, what's the kosher amount of time for one to study for that test? I don't know because I wish I had an answer. Sorry, I don't have an answer, but- what I Everyone's different. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I can give you a, I can give you a definitive answer for the bar exam, but for the LSAT, I don't know, right? Because I don't know when it, you know people started studying. You know, it's like you don't know in college who necessarily is like studying for the LSAT, and everyone's studying at different times. It's not like it's not like okay, everyone starts studying at this you know you know date, and then we all take it at the same time. It's offered I think four times a year, 
And so you could take it at different times and you could take it up to, I don't know if, I think if you know, the LSAT has changed since I've taken it, but I think you could take it three times within five years or something like that. Um, that doesn't feel like a lot. No, I don't think so either. Because I remember like um, one of my best friends and I, we were both wanting, we would have taken it a million times just to see how, mm -hmm. how like what our highest score could be, you know? But they were like, no, three and you're done. We're like, oh my God, that's it, you know? But it's, it's a learnable test. But I remember like almost enjoying it towards the end because you know when you're learning something and you're getting good at it, you're like, you know what? It's not so bad actually. And that's kind of how I felt towards the end. So it wasn't actually so bad. It wasn't the bar exam. So for those of us who are not attorneys, what is the bar exam? So the LSAT is the admissions test to get into law school. Um, and then the bar exam, you can only take, you have to apply to take it once you are, you know, set to graduate law school. So it's the test to become an attorney. So when you graduate law school, you're not automatically permitted to start practicing law. Uh, it just means that you have a, you know, legal education. Um, but the bar exam is what admits you to and allows you to begin practicing law. And there are different components to it. You know, there's character and fitness, and then there's the actual test itself. Some states operate on the uniform bar exam where, I don't remember the current count, but last time I checked, it was like 26 or 27 states um, are a part of it. And if you take one bar exam in any of those states, you can, you're, I don't know if you're automatically admitted or you can be admitted to any of the other ones. Um, Florida's not a part of it. <laughs> So, of course. Um, and so I was licensed in Virginia. And when I moved to Florida, I had to take the bar exam all over again, because there's no reciprocity here. And so if you want to, if you're practicing in any other state in the country, and you want to move to Florida, um, you're, you have to take it again. Doesn't matter if you're 50, doesn't matter if you've been practicing for 50 years, you know, um, you have to take it again. Did you... Uh, participate in any sort of like moot court or trial team when you were in law school that you would recommend that someone participates in? Yeah, I did. I was a part of the mock trial team. We called it trial advocacy board. When it comes to competition teams, there are two routes you can go. One is, you know, mock trial, which is the trial team. And then one is the um, appellate, you know, argument team, the competing at the appellate level, essentially. So you're making more oral argument and you're talking again, like how I was describing earlier with the appellate courts, that's, that's the type of law that you're, you're dealing with there. But with mock trial and trial team in general, you're handling evidence and witnesses and um, doing direct examinations and cross examinations, openings, closings, right? And that's very different than the moot court team. So I did, again, because I wanted to be a trial attorney, I did the trial team. And knowing that there's so many different types of law that one can go into, if your story was different from you being that excited 12-year-old young girl, knowing what she wanted to do, was there anything else that triggered that passion inside to go into your specific field? So I have a lot of interest outside of criminal law but nothing sets a fire in me like criminal law does, nothing. And I had explored other avenues. I really did, right? Because I clerked for three years. I handled so many different types of cases, you know, from corporations suing each other to, I mean, rapes and, and murders to divorces, to a state administration, to, I, I mean, you name it, I, I've handled it except for bankruptcy, because that's exclusively a federal um, matter. But basically everything else I get my toes into. And I would get offers, I'm like, I don't want to take it because I don't, I can't see myself doing it every day. I can't, that's not what's going to like, I'm not going to wake up with excitement, you know, over that, you know, after doing it for seven years, I don't see myself, you know, feeling what I feel currently. It's going to be tough, but love what you do at the end of the day because of the sweat, blood, and tears that are involved. Absolutely. Couldn't agree more. Yes, you hit the nail on the head. I mean, at least for me, right? Like, I, I, I would say everybody should have a serious conversation with themselves. No one else in the room, not, you know, a mom, dad, best friend, boyfriend, girlfriend. No, just yourself. At the end of the day, what do you love 
you know, in terms of, you know, a, a field, right? Like what work do you love more than anything, right? If you take money out of the picture, if you take whatever it might be out of the picture and you just think of what are you enthusiastic about, that is what you should do because we spend the majority of our lives working, right? Like that's just what we do. Five out of seven days of a week, we're working right? at least. And so um, I, I think that it's so important. And I, especially when it comes to the law, I think that if you're, if you just are, you know, not, you don't know what to do next, or if you're just in it for the money, this is not the field. There are easier, less stressful ways to make a living. I promise you just go pursue law is not for, you know, someone who's just thinking that, Oh, I don't really know what my next move is. No, I, I really recommend against that. Then. Can you give us the difference between civil versus criminal law in layman's terms? So it's, it's a funny just answer. It's a funny description is what I'm going to say, because criminal, anything that's not criminal is civil. Okay. <laughs> anything. You name it, it falls in civil if it's not criminal. Whether it's, you know, family law, if it's insurance defense, if it's bankruptcy, tax law, you know, whatever else, insert any other type of law, it's civil if it's not criminal. When one wants to build their ladder of success to, you know, the top tier of criminal law, what do you believe is the best journey for them up that ladder of success? There are really only three that I can think of positions that you, if you're really set on doing criminal law, you either become a prosecutor, a public defender, or a private criminal defense attorney. I can't think of anything else, right? I mean, that's basically it when it comes to criminal law. Two of those three are for the, you know, you're working for the government. And one of those, you're working in the private sector. Most people don't get their start in private criminal defense they generally, you know, prosecute or are public defender first and then go to, you know, the private sector if that's what they want to do. I'm not saying everyone does that. Um, but if that's what you want to do, you know, you start out, you know, as an entry level, you know, attorney in any of those offices and then you work your way up, you know. Um, but that's specifically for you know, criminal law for the civil realm. There's so many other routes and, you know, your path can go a million different ways. So I understand that there are some different subsets of criminal law. Could you define some of those subsets for us? If I would break it down, maybe other people would break it down differently. I would say there's basically blue collar crime and white collar crime. Your white collar crime looks a lot like, you know, Ponzi schemes. <laughs> and money, um, you know, crime where it's like business, like Enron, right? You know, that type of situation. Whereas blue collar crime is, you know, the, the DUI, the rape, the murder, the arson. Um, and for me, that's what I like more. I don't really like white collar crime, but that's where the money is, is white collar crime. Um, and, you know, they're very, I think they're very different. You're dealing with a very different type of defendant in those, you know, types of cases. If somebody wants to be in the FBI or work for the federal government, is there a certain path they should take in doing so? I wouldn't say that there's a certain path. I would say that there's going to be a very select few people who can, you know, work their way into that sort of you know, a, a job or field because they are so selective. For example, the FBI, they are investigating crimes for sometimes years before they ever even give any sort of indication to anybody that they are on to someone. They can know every detail about someone's life, right? For years <laughs> and be watching them for years because they have, you know, reason to believe that there are crimes being committed by this person. And at that point, when they feel like they have enough evidence, that's when, you know, offense will come out and, you know, become a little, a little bit more public. But the level of confidentiality and the level of secrecy and skill set and everything. So I like that we touched on media interpretation and representation of criminal law to the public. What are some common misconceptions that you've encountered? It's such a good question because... I dive right into this 
ev like every time I pick a jury, basically, because people do expect that, you know, a trial is going to be like law and order, right? And it's going to be like CSI and all these shows. And I'm like, oh my God, it's making the public think that this is how the law works. And it's not at all how it works, right? For example, if you're walking on the street and someone steals your pocketbook, are you going to have physical evidence about, you know, like from that happening? Probably not. If someone just, if someone runs by and takes your pocketbook, what, are you going to have like DNA evidence and you're going to have, you know, videos of that? No, right? There's no, there, in most cases, I would say that I deal with, there's not that physical scientific evidence. Um, sometimes there is, but not always. You have to gauge, you know, when, especially when there's, you know, a jury panel, you have a jury trial. I have to make sure that people aren't expecting that from, you know, for me to show that, you know, there's fingerprints if it's, let's say, a DUI. There are challenges with that for sure. And we do our best to overcome them um, when picking a jury. So how long would a typical case take to work through the justice system? Because I know in Law & Order, it takes like 24 hours. <laughs> it takes like 42 minutes with the murder, you know. Um, yeah. it, it really varies. It depends. I know it's like the most annoying lawyer answer ever, but it really does depend. Because you can have a simple case that it's the first time it comes into court and we're already reaching a plea agreement. And then I never see it again. I don't even, you know, like it's just so simple right and then there are cases where it's years old and there's been a lot of motions that are filed um things like motions to suppress or a motion in limine a motion to take depositions whatever the motion might be and then the hearings that follow maybe there's been a change in defense attorneys right there's just so many things that can happen we touched on a lot of different very specific legal jargon I want to kind of pull a couple out and define them now. So can we talk about maybe pleading, charging, prosecution, any, any kind of main terms that you okay. feel that we should define for our listeners? So pleading can be both a noun and a verb. <laughs> um, a pleading can be something that you file with the court, right? Um, and then someone can plead to a charge that's brought against them. A charge is the offense that the, not to use the word in the definition, because that is like the last thing we should be doing, but it's what the state is charging someone with. You know, if, if I'm saying, Alex, you committed this burglary, <laughs> you know, like I'm charging you with burglary. You know what I mean? That's, that's what a charge is. <laughs> Prosecution is the act of, bringing the charge against someone, or it's the noun saying that the prosecution, you know, the body that's bringing the charge. Um, what other legal words are there? So a public defender is a criminal defense attorney that is appointed by the court to um, a criminal defendant when they are indigent. Indigent meaning they are not above a certain um, they don't have a certain amount of money, either saved up or via income, whatever it might be. Because of that, they are given a public defender should they choose to have that person. If you know someone is indigent and they don't want a public defender and they somehow you know want to get a criminal defense attorney who is private, they can do that, of course. Um, but a public defender is a government employee as well. If somebody wants to dive into internships or getting a job that would help better them in their field but don't have any contacts what would be the best steps for them honestly probably just looking it up online right typing in whatever you're interested in and then internship into google i think that you'll get a lot of results i used to do that you know um even though i had a lot of contacts and i had a lot of resources um that were made available to me because of my, you know, school, because of my fraternity, because of the other clubs I was in and so on and so forth. But I think that just doing the research, you will find these things generally pretty easily because people are, who are hiring, they want to make it, you know, readily available and accessible to potential candidates. 
And is there a certain etiquette for one to go about doing so? I think cold emailing is one of the best things ever. It's maybe a little nerve wracking at first, but I think it's one of the most best kept secrets, to be honest, when it comes to reaching out to a potential employer. I would say to hone your email writing skills. If you get an email that's messy or has mistakes in it, or just doesn't, I don't know, doesn't give you a good first impression of someone, then they're not going to consider you. But if it's very professional, you include your resume and you tell them why you're interested and you make it personal and short, but just, you know, one to two paragraphs appropriately. I think that, you know, you're not going to get responses from everyone. Every 10 that you send, maybe you'll get one, right? And that one could lead to your next job. So can you walk us through a typical day? So pre-pandemic, I would wake up so early, between like 4.30 and 5.30 every day. And I was at the office between 6.30 and 7 every day. Um, and I would leave maybe like 12 hours later every day. And so it was a, long days, very, very long days. I have port half of the week usually. And so for the two or three days that I'm we, have, we call them docket days. So I have a few hundred cases that are mine. Is that a typical caseload? Yeah. A lot of cases. Mm -hmm. it, I mean, it depends on if the prosecutor has a, is a, spe, is a specialty prosecutor, right? So maybe if they only deal with homicides, they have maybe 30 cases, but that's very different, right? What I'm doing, yeah, we have, we have a few hundred cases. And I remember when I first started out, you know, they were saying, all right, we're starting you at light with 180. And I was like, oh, gotta, okay. Yeah. You know, I handle probably, I don't know, maybe about 100 cases a week in court. And so that's just what I do in court, right? Um, that doesn't include my trials in court. So I, I had a trial a couple of weeks ago. Um, it was non-jury because no jury trials are happening during the pandemic. But it was non-jury trial. And and so if I have, you know, a trial that week, I have that, that you know, you still dock the days and you then have your trial on top of it. And then on top of all that, you have, you know, your cases that are coming in, you know, for the first time that are coming up. So you have to prepare what's called discovery. So discovery is the evidence that we basically turn over to the other side because we give the defense everything that we have um, that we're intending to use against them in their case. We turn all that over to them and we make them a plea offer. And so we call that whole process doing discovery. And then there's a lot of follow-up on cases. I need to, you know, contact a victim to discuss the case with them. You know, that's not gonna be the only time I'm probably speaking with them. I'll probably follow up again with them and let them know what's happening in the case and discuss, you know, where the defense lies on the case and and you know where we go from here because if the defense isn't willing to take a plea we probably have to set it for trial how do they feel about that okay they're good with that we need to then prepare for trial there's a lot that goes on behind the scenes right there's a lot of follow-up there's a lot of preparing for cases there's a lot of being in court for cases and talking to defense counsel on cases you know and, and negotiating and sometimes the, our victims are represented by attorneys. We don't represent victims. We advocate for their best interests, you know, because they were harmed and or wronged by the defendant's criminal offense, right? But we don't represent them. Being a woman in criminal law, can you talk about any unique experiences you may have had or you have on a daily occurrence that continue in your professional life or in your personal life? One that really stands out to me is my first day in the courtroom as a prosecutor. One of my colleagues introduced me to a criminal defense attorney. We were in the courtroom and, you know, we just shook hands, said our names, and that was it. And when he was done with his case, because again, a lot of cases happen, you know, it's not just one case at a time. So he wasn't the only other attorney in, in the courtroom. Um, there were a lot of attorneys in the courtroom and, and he was walking out when he was done with his case. 
And he was like, bye dear, it was, it was nice to meet you. And I was like, what? We're in court, you know? <laughs> um, it's something that I think a lot of women deal with in this profession. I think that recent, in recent years, there's been an equal number of men and women generally admitted to law school. Actually, I think that there have been some years where more women have been going to law school than men. But generally speaking, it's about even, but there are still so many more men in the profession than there are women. I think that there are certain double standards that um, women do face in terms of, you know, being called too soft, too aggressive, too this, too that, that men don't hear those words, you know, it, about their behavior or the way that they act, um, unless it's super extreme, you know, but even the slightest deviation off of just even keeled, cool, calm, collected, everyone, you know, you know, will make, will pass judgment or say you're this or you're that. And I, I see that a lot more, um, you know, directed towards women than I do see it towards men. And for any women that are stepping in the same profession as you, do you have any insight when it comes to the etiquette or how to approach a situation like that? I would say remain professional, but if someone oversteps a boundary, you don't need to remain silent about it. I never want to silence any woman who deals with any sort of misconduct. That is something that I think we have done. And when I say we, I mean, as a society, right? We've done for ever. <laughs> um, and I think that if you can find a trusted um, colleague or mentor or someone who you really do trust, right? You can't just go up to a random person. You don't know what their intentions might be. You don't know, if, <laughs> you know where that could go. But if it's someone you really do trust, and someone that you respect in the field and someone who is respected in the field, right? Because someone who has been around for a while and who's, you know, who wants to see you succeed. And if they advocate for you, that is so meaningful. I'm not just saying meaningful in how the situation plays out, but meaningful internally. <laughs> I think that, you know, there are real issues in, you know, society when it comes to, placing double standards on women and trying to stifle the uh, success of women. And there are boundaries that have been put in women's place for ever. I keep saying that because I'm trying to find another word to say forever, but there is, I, I'm at a loss. Don't feel like you're crazy if you're feeling certain emotions because you've dealt with that. You are not alone. Um, I would say that most women I know have dealt with people talking down to them or not treating them as professionally as they should or judging certain actions that they do, even though they're being, you know, they're being professional and they're totally fine because they just are using almost intimidation tactics or whatever it might be. Would it be safe for me to say that for men coming into your field as well, it would be who of them to bring awareness that these things do happen and to stand up for a situation. I think the latter of what you said, especially, I think that when a male stands up for a female in that position, it makes the person who's, you know, being unprofessional, it makes them step back and say, okay, I'm not, maybe I won't get away with this, right? There is someone who is aware of this. It's a male who's aware of this. Um, and, you know, I do think that it adds more, I don't know. I don't want to say adds more weight because there is already weight that exists to whatever situation someone is going through. Um, but it appears to the person who's doing this that it adds more weight, <laughs> uh, more credence yeah. to the complaint or, or to the frustration or whatever it might be, you know? Just bringing awareness to the situation because unfortunately if it's, a, if it's a pattern or a habit, it might not even resonate the weight really what they're doing to another individual in that kind of situation yeah 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 it's easy when you're young male or female 
just to kind of be taken advantage of. You might not know 100% what you're talking about. It's important to find those allies who are respected in your field and who can either validate what you're going through or say, maybe we need to take a step back. Mm -hmm. just so that you can have that perspective on the situation. I will say, um, I was so fortunate because in the beginning of my career, I worked for judges, right? Who were my allies. They were my advocates. They stood by me and listen, every lawyer had to go in front of them in that area, right? Any lawyer I was dealing with had to go in front of them. So there was no avoiding... (laughs) my ally, my gatekeeper. You know, I was just out of law school and there's totally imposter syndrome, right? Where you're like, Why am, I, am I doing any of this right? Any of it? Like, did they make a mistake in hiring me? You know, you think you have these thoughts and I would, lawyers would get on the phone and screaming, I've been doing this for 20 years. If I, if I had a penny for every time a lawyer has told me, I've been doing this for fill in the blank years. <laughs> I would be a rich woman, okay? Um, (laughs) And, you know, there was one time a lawyer was, I mean, just going on and on and on. And the judge happened to walk in while the attorney was screaming so loudly that the judge could even hear it through the phone. It wasn't on speakerphone. (laughs) And my judge walked out and said to my secretary, get him on the phone. And calls up the lawyer and demanded that he call me and apologize and put that lawyer in his place really quick. A moment I will never forget because when someone verbally stands up for you, there is no, I don't know if anything compares. It's an incomparable feeling to be honest. Also think that we all can take on mentees and you know, I love when women champion other women. I think that it's, it's so, uh, it's special they feel like they can grow to and they don't feel like anything can get in their way when they have a woman that they can look up to who has achieved something along the lines of what they want to achieve. What are some ways that you disconnect or that you unwind from work when you get home? I'm very into weightlifting. It's a hobby. It's like a social thing for me. It's every, you know, it's not just a, I want to stay healthy, which I love that I have, it happens to assist me in staying healthy, but it's not, you know, the only or main even reason that I I do it. I just got a dog. So he brings me infinite happiness. Um, Trashy TV, always a go-to. I like writing. I'm very into writing poetry. I love traveling. Is that, is that an outlet? Yes, of course. Yeah, and, and those are all great outlets. It's really important, especially when you have a high stress career path, to find your outlet, find that thing that makes mm-hmm. you feel good. How did you learn how to make mistakes, or how did you work through the process of making mistakes with with a job that's so high stakes all the time? I think that I was very fortunate. Clerking for almost three years really put me in a good position to go into this job. It really gives you invaluable insight to judges minds how the system works what's good what's bad in terms of practicing in terms of writing in terms of everything when i went into this job after having clerked for three years i was very comfortable with judges like judges are my people right you know that's where i feel comfortable is interacting with judges and i'm I'm very confident in my emotions because i was reviewing motions and telling the judges, you know, <laughs> the quality of the motions that, that, you know, were coming before the judges, I was telling them whether they were good or not so good. In terms of mm-hmm. litigating and actually, you know, appearing before the judge and not working behind, you know, the scenes and were with the judge, that was a shift for me, um, which of course, I mean, that was expected. That was exactly what I knew was going to happen, but um, <laughs> I, you know, But I, listen, it's a steep learning curve for sure. But I think that it probably wasn't as steep for me because I wasn't right out of law school. I think that I learned pretty quickly. I'm still learning. I learn new things every single day, truly. And that's one of the million reasons I love my job. I have made, I'm sure, countless mistakes. And that's just what happens when you start a new job. What do you do to ground yourself before you walk into that courtroom? 
I rock out in my car for sure. Um, and it pumps me up, definitely. <laughs> Other than that, there's not that much. I try to make sure before a trial, especially that I go to bed early and that, you know, I eat a good breakfast even if I don't want to eat anything because I usually don't. Because you, the day of trial, the adrenaline is so high <laughs> that you don't want to eat. You don't think about eating. You don't think about anything other than getting to the trial, right? For me, I feel best going into court overprepared. So that's what I will work on until the second before, you know, I have to go in. This has been so informative and so wonderful. Thank you for joining us, Brooke. Before we wrap up, are there five key takeaways that you want to communicate to our listeners if they want to follow in your footsteps? I would really have a deep conversation with yourself and see what your passion is. What are you enthusiastic about? I think that to get through the, you know, law school, the bar exam, you know, the job, even, you know, post law school and everything, you need that passion. My second thing I would say is to join a club or some sort of extracurricular activity, whether you're in college or you're not in college, whatever it might be, if you can find a club that is related in any way to the law, whether it's student government, whether it's, you know, a co-ed pre-law fraternity, if it's a criminal justice club, criminal law society, whatever it might be, um, a CSI watching club, I don't know, I'm making that up, but if, I'm sure that exists, right? Um, whatever it might be, dive into it because you can meet a lot of people. You'll be around a lot of like-minded people and you'll see, do I even want to be around these types of people? <laughs> right? So like, that's the first thing. Do I, do I like these people? Do I want to be around the type of people who are into this as well? If not, then that's also a good indicator that maybe this isn't the profession for you. Also, you know, you build connections and it's networking. It's, I would say a third thing is intern, intern, intern. I think that internships lead to other internships. That's the thing is that maybe it's not your ideal internship that you wanted, but it will lead to another internship that'll lead to another internship. Or it would be, I think that wearing a suit, I don't want to say all the time, but basically all the time, is major, especially for women. The first impression you make when meeting somebody is your visual impression, right? Before you even say a word, they see you. And I think that dressing professionally on a consistent basis contributes to that. My number five, hone your communication, people, and writing skills. You need to be able to read people. You need to be able to understand nonverbal communication that is coming your way from someone else. I think, I think it's so important, and, and especially also for trial attorneys, you need to be able to read your jurors. Being able to interact with people is important. Being able to advocate and articulate what you want in the way that you want, in the way that you should, is super important. Sorry, if I can add one more. Yeah. But clerking, doing a judicial clerkship, because that is how you can hone those skills that I was just talking about. I, I don't even think I was a remotely good writer until I started clerking. At the time, before my clerkship, I thought that I was a fine writer, but oh my God, it's night and day. I cannot recommend doing a judicial clerkship enough. I think that it's invaluable. It is something that, you know, there's no other experience that a lawyer can get that provides you the skill set that you get from clerking. Brooke, thank you so much for taking time and giving us and our viewers insight to your field of work. You know, I want to encourage people who want to do this. And it's exciting to think that people could be passionate about this, you know? Thank you. Bye, guys. Thank you.